Please stand for the gospel reading. The gospel for the second Sunday of Easter is taken from the 20th chapter of John. Glory to you, O Lord. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands and put my finger in the mark of the nails and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were closed, were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you might come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life in his name. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Please be seated. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. Let's pray. Gracious God, we give you thanks for the gift of resurrection life and pray that as we journey through this season of Easter together that more and more we might recognize and live into the gift that it is for us today. Amen. On Easter last Sunday, I shared a little bit about my father's death back in 1971. And I want to pick up there a little bit today because we join the disciples in the gospel reading today in a very familiar but uncomfortable place following Jesus' death. You see, the disciples gather in the shadow of death. They gather still in the grasp of grief, uncertain about Jesus. They didn't believe what the women ran back and told them. That's where we left it last week. They're uncertain about Jesus, his identity, his teachings, how to be his disciples now. And locked in that room, it seems to me, that day, they were like a ship that's lost sail and rudder, not knowing what to do. So that week after my father died, after the funeral, we went to the cemetery to bury him. And I felt I'd done pretty good that week. I mean, after all, I was the, the oldest kid, the oldest of five. I'd sucked it up and, and stayed pretty calm and held it together all week. And this was now Thursday after that Sunday when we got the phone call. I was in shock, as we all were. I even insisted on going to the funeral home and seeing Dad's body as a way of getting through that shock. And yet... When the final benediction was announced at the graveside, and as they did then, the casket was symbolically lowered a bit into the grave, into the ground, I just couldn't hold it together any longer. And I burst into sobbing, and Pastor Setcher came over and put his arm around me, big arm from a big guy, <laughs> and those that know him know what I speak of. The reality of the finality of death finally landed on me with its full weight, and I was crushed. 
Several months later, as clear and vivid as day, I had a dream. I dreamed that I came home from school and I walked in the door and turned to the den and there was dad sitting on the sofa. And he got up and gave me a big hug. And then we sat down and we watched the Atlanta Braves on TV. Which was a miracle in itself because that was before cable TV and we were always sitting on the back porch listening to the radio. But we listened to the Braves game. And after that dream, I was much more at peace with my grief and the life that continued to unfold for us. And I've learned in subsequent years that many people have dreams about loved ones following their death. But that dream helped give me the assurance that dad was okay, that dad was with Christ, and that we'd be okay. During the season of Lent, we had four deaths in this congregation. Bill Killian, Justin Ficker, Annie Johnson, Andy Johnson, and uh, Dorwin Larson just last week. And those deaths moved the families into that uncomfortable place where grief and faith coexist. We gathered, in this, we gathered in this place for their memorial services and we gathered seeking the assurance that death wasn't the end. Seeking assurance of resurrection life with Christ. Today we read in the 20th chapter of John, we join the disciples that first Easter Eve locked in that room because they didn't want to end up like Jesus had ended up a couple of days before. They were there in that dreaded, uncomfortable place where grief definitely exists. And their faith was struggling to exist. They had witnessed Jesus die and their grief was powerfully real and present. How might their faith in Jesus, faith that had motivated them to leave everything, some of them three years before, leave their families, their homes, their jobs, all their security and follow Jesus, how is that, that going to exist there in that dark shadow of death? Today in the 20th chapter of John, the gospel writer records at least three clues that assure us, that assured them of Jesus' resurrection and encouraged faith in the early church and encourages faith in us now. I think the first assurance is one of those things that loses in translation. It's the Greek, specific Greek word that John chose to use for life. You see, in, in Greek, there's three, at least three words that are translated as life. Two of them John didn't use. Psyche, we think about psychology, right? And bios, biology. Psyche and bios refer to the life that we all share with every animal, the living, breathing, walking life in this world. Okay, it's just life. But the third word, that's the one that John chose. And that's so key because it was the Greek word zoe. Zoology comes from that. And Professor Frank Crouch unpacked it this way. He said, zoe, this is eternal life. Literally, he said, life of the age. It's life given to those who believe. Life given to those who are born of God. Life that in John transforms us from merely existing, psyche and bios, to living, zoe, in the abundance and eternity of God. It's life in the abundance and eternity of God. That's the word John chose for that reason to encourage our faith. In fact, John chose it. He'd chosen it before, way back in the beginning of John's gospel. Remember the prologue, those incredibly beautiful poetic words? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. And all things came into being through Him. And without Him, not one thing came into being. Here it is. 
What has come into being in him was life, zoe. And the life, the zoe, was the light of all people. There at the beginning, the life that came into being in Christ was zoe. And in chapter 20, where some scholars think John's original gospel may have ended, is zoe again, holding it together, coming full circle. And John ends verse 31 today with, But these words are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus was the Messiah, was the Word of God, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have Zoe, life in His name. Zoe brings us into the fullness of God, the abundance of life with God here and now, and by the grace of God, the potential to believe and to follow Jesus so that the quality of our life, our psyche and bios life is changed as more and more we live into the commission that Jesus gives to all of us to be a community and an ambassador of forgiveness that God's offered to all people through Christ. A second assurance that John gives us in the gospel reading today is that we have this life, this zoe, by the creating, renewing breath of God. Breath of God. I think that when John, in writing this, was intentional to have Jesus breathe on them for a number of reasons, but I, I think he wanted us to think of other times we had encountered the breath of God in Scripture. Think back. When Jesus... breathed on them. Remember back to Genesis 2, the second creation story there. Remember, the writer said, Then the Lord God formed man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And the man became a living being. The breath of God animated the clay. And again, Later in Ezekiel 37, Ezekiel has this incredible vision of the valley of dry bones and God commands the prophet Ezekiel to speak to the dry, lifeless bones. Sounds kind of pointless, right? And Ezekiel says, but then he said to me, prophesy to the breath, prophesy mortal and say to the breath, thus says the Lord God, come from the four winds, O breath. And breathe upon these slain that they may live. And Ezekiel says, I prophesied as he commanded me. And the breath came into them and they lived and stood on their feet. A vast multitude. You see, the breath of God brings life. Zoe, renewed life. The breath of the Son of God brings the power of life as God's people overwhelming death, scattering the shadow of grief and empowering our witness in life to the resurrected Christ. A third assurance John provides in our gospel reading this morning to assure us and strengthen us as we dwell in the shadow of grief is the witness of Thomas. Thomas doesn't really doubt, I don't think. Thomas just wants the same experience that his fellow disciples had. He wants that physical experience of Jesus being resurrected. So when the seeking faith of Thomas is rewarded by the appearance of Jesus again in their midst, Thomas makes the clearest and most powerful confession of faith, the most powerful identification of Jesus in the Gospel of John. Upon seeing the wounds of Jesus, they let him know it was really and truly Jesus. The one they had seen died was standing there with them then. Thomas exclaimed, my Lord and my God. My Lord and my God. That confession of faith. And again, John has bracketed his gospel. He's tying it all together here for us. Because way back in the prologue, Way back in the prologue, John began with the declaration of the identity of Jesus, didn't he? 
In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. The Word was God. My Lord and my God ties it right together, that witness. So Thomas's confession brackets the gospel, but it's also the recognition that only comes from Zoe, the life that comes from the breath of God, blowing and breathing new and abundant, revitalized life within us and the peace that Christ alone brings. Now the breath of Christ in Zoe doesn't mean that, that we'll see our loved ones physically again in this world, but it does assure us that because of that abundant life now and eternal life, that in God's due time, we will be gathered and share in that life, that Zoe life, eternal life, with Christ and all the saints where death has finally lost its power completely and grief is no more. And finally, you notice that, uh, again, like I told the kids, there are certain numbers in Scripture that mean things. Seven is that complete number of creation. Well, three is another important number. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, for instance. How many times does Jesus say, peace be with you in this passage? Three times. I'm glad you counted. It's a holy number. And I think, and I'm almost sure that John did this intentionally to underscore the certainty that Christ is truly risen and brings the life and the peace that shatters death's grip. The peace that enables us, empowers us to go and to proclaim the gospel of Jesus, grace, forgiveness, and resurrection life. Now each of us has been, might still be, or could be in the future, in that uncomfortable space of grief. The good news of the gospel today is that you and I have had resurrection life breathed into us. A life that's God's gift for abundant life now, eternal life later, and peace that begins now and continues to eternity. And with this life, God has gathered us together into a community of forgiven people called and sent, commissioned to proclaim in word and deed in our lives the good news of resurrection life and forgiveness to all the world. Amen. Christ is risen. He's risen indeed. Hallelujah.